Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here today. Welcome to worship. We also want to greet those of you that are watching by way of Facebook. It is good to have you with us too. We'll begin with some announcements, it looks like. There you go. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. A uh, couple of announcements about the pumpkin patch. Uh, one, again, thank you to everybody who has come out and volunteered to move pumpkins, work the pack. I mean, work the uh, the sales, <coughs> everything. So we've had we've had a great turnout so far this year. We are currently just a few dollars shy of twelve thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, so we're really. Still, we're still slightly behind last year, but in looking at the forecast, we've got beautiful weather between now and the 31st. So uh, it should be a, a, big, a big next couple weeks. Second is we've got the pumpkin unload today. So we're asking everybody, once we get done here, go home, change your clothes, get something to eat, and come on back out between 12 and 12.30. Hopefully the truck will be here by then. Uh, we shouldn't have as many pumpkins as we had last time but we still need folks to help get them off. If you've got friends, neighbors, uh, grandkids, kids, whoever, let's grab them and bring them on out here and, and, uh, and let's have some fun. It's always fun uh, doing what we do. So again, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. You can hand that off to Bob. Good morning. A couple of announcements um, related to the pumpkin patch. The the men were able to sell about $125 worth of hot dogs and hamburgers yesterday at lunch, uh, which was really good. And the ladies were able to sell some baked goods around $25 worth, so that was good. Uh, we intend to do it again next Saturday at lunch. So if you want to come by and get yourself a nice little hamburger hot dog at lunch, you're welcome to, as well as get your pumpkin. So next Saturday at lunchtime, 11.30 to 1.30ish, whatever. We are also going to be cooking hot dogs and hamburgers at the Trunk or Treat next Sunday at, starting at 4. So um, you'll be able to get yourself some afternoon dinner as you're also enjoying the Trunk or Treat uh, activities that are going on. So please come out and support us. Second announcement is this. The men are going to go ahead are starting the Coats for Kids again. We've done it the last several years, and your response has been overwhelming as far as donating coats and so forth. In fact... We still have over $500 worth set aside from last year as donations that you all made that we can use to supplement whatever we bring in. So far, we have, we have signed up the Rock Hill Head Start Again program. Fred Garrison is going to have coordinating that. So at this point, we need coats that will cover the ages from 3 to 8. And they can be brought in on Sunday, next Sunday, and left in the Acolyte Room. Or during the week, bring them into the parlor, and one of us men will get them over to the acolyte room as we can. So uh, go out and go ahead and see if you can go ahead and bring in some of those things, uh, new coats uh, for those kids who really need them, especially in the Rock Hill Head Start program. I also would like to ask if there are co folks who are willing to coordinate coats to one of our elementary schools. In the past, we've had a couple elementary schools. We've had folks coordinate and those are usually larger sizes, but rather than ask for that, I'd like to go ahead and see if there's folks willing to be coordinate coats that would go to one of the elementary schools in the area. If you are willing to be a coordinator, please let me know, also, or let Fred Garrison know. And we'd be glad to go ahead and, and get that word out to the folks. But for now, let's get sizes between three and eight and bring them in, and uh, let's see if we can help these kids stay warm because it's turning cold now. So uh, we'll be running this, I think, through to about mid-November. So you have plenty of time to go out and get them when you're out shopping or if you do it online, however you want to do it. Uh, bring them in and uh, we'll be able to get them to the kids who need them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay, seeing none, let's turn to our time of prayer, concerns, and praises. What things shall we be in prayer for this week? The Connor family. The Connor family. Susie Keesler. 
and Lucy King. And Barbara Campbell's great grandbaby. And Cullen's granddad. Yes, all the people who have been affected by both of the hurricanes. Debbie Carey Carey. Well, we have a big praise and that tomorrow we are having our first session of the Memory Connection. We've got five people signed up to participate. And how many volunteers tomorrow, Juliet? Eight. Eight volunteers who will be coming. So we um, pray God's blessing on that endeavor and uh, look forward to seeing what God is going to be doing here. Any other prayer concerns or praises? Okay, if not, then I invite you to stand and share signs of Christ's peace with one another. If you would, please turn now in your bulletin to the call to worship and let us read these lines responsively. God, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. To you they cried, and they were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame.
you would please um, be seated and then turn in your bulletin to the morning prayer. And let us pray these words together. You alone are holy, O God. You alone are good. Help us to let go of worldly goods and leave lesser things behind so that we may be ready to enter your holy realm on that day when the first are last and the last are first. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And now let us continue by praying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples and us also to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now our hymn of celebration is found on page 147. If you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing. page 885, where we will be using a modern affirmation to affirm our faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, 
whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. may be seated. Who could wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Let me tell you about my Jesus and all the things he brought to Calvary. Do you feel that thing is stealing and you're desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. Who can wipe away those tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would going on to if you could who could work it all for your good let me tell you about my jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let my jesus change your life hallelujah 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 amen 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 who would take my cross to calvary Pay the price for all my guilty Who would feel that way about me Let me tell you about my Jesus 
He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 And let my Jesus save your life. Yes, we can. We can go home now is what um, I think Nancy said. Yes. Our scripture reading today is the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They sneer at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him be the one to rescue you, or let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. I knew I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of preparation is number 577. You may remain seated while we sing.
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are familiar words, aren't they? Have you heard them before? Of course you have. They are the words, some of the words that Jesus spoke when he hung on the cross dying for us. When he said that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was intentionally invoking this particular psalm. And um, we want to spend a few minutes talking about it this morning so that we can see why it makes sense that of all the psalms he could have chosen to have brought up at his death, why he may have picked this particular one. So we'll walk through the psalm together. First of all, the psalmist is crying out that he is feeling forsaken. He believes that God has left him all alone. He says, why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? He feels that God is very far away and not responding to the cry for help that he's making in this great suffering he's experiencing. He says, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. So the psalmist is praying day and night, but doesn't get an answer and can't rest at night for wanting to hear something from God, but God is not responding. And then suddenly we get this shift in tone where the psalmist goes from complaining about God's absence to remembering what God has done in ages past. The psalmist says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And so this becomes not just a psalm of lament or a psalm of complaint, but a psalm also of praise. He remembers how God's, or how the ancestors trusted in God. They trusted you and you delivered them. So the psalmist is remembering the times that the people of Israel called out to God in their distress, and God responded to their cries for help by saving them, by saving them from the Egyptians at the Red Sea, by parting the waters and letting them go across, or by saving them from all of the enemies that tried to get the better of them when they were living in the period of the judges. So the psalmist is recalling all of these times where God has responded to a plea for help from the people. He says, to you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So the psalmist is remembering how God heard the prayers and the pleas of the people and answered them so that the people weren't ashamed. They weren't calling out to a God who wouldn't answer. And then he returns to the present suffering and says, but I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. Probably Jesus was feeling this, don't you imagine, while he was hanging on the cross. He returns to the present condition of suffering and says that he feels less than human because of the mistreatment of others. And then he says, all who see me mock me. They sneer at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. So those who see him crying out to God mock him in his suffering. They see him crying out and they see that God is not responding. So they mock him. They mock him because he continues to believe in God despite this suffering and despite the fact that God has not responded to his calls for help. And then we shift gears again in verse nine. He says, Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe at my brother, mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. So again, he's recalling God's presence and God's help in times that have gone by. He's remembering God's presence with him 
leading him throughout his life from the time of his birth. And then he says, do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Again, this is a plea for God to do something, to relieve the suffering that is going on, because he feels all alone, that there is no one coming to help him. And then he points out how he is surrounded by enemies that want to eat him alive. He writes, many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. And then he talks about how he feels completely done in. Again, as I imagine Jesus must have been feeling as he died on the cross. He says, I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. He feels completely done in, so much so that even his bones won't work to hold him up. And his heart is melted from the despair that he is experiencing in this terrible aloneness. And then he continues to describe his suffering, saying, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. So he continues to describe the suffering that he's experiencing. Talks about feeling thirsty. Remember how Jesus said from the cross that he thirsts and um, was given something to drink. And then he says that God leaves him in the dust of death. So... Why might Jesus have invoked this particular psalm at his death? What, what reason, out of all the psalms that we have, why may he have called up this one and wanted us to think about it? Well, that's because there are several messages that this psalm has for us. The first is that God can handle all of our feelings even when we're angry at or feeling frustrated or abandoned by God. God can handle our anger. Notice that God doesn't strike the psalmist down for saying that he's been abandoned by God. He doesn't strike the psalmist down for talking about having been left in the dust of death. So the psalms are permission-giving to all of us in that there is no emotion that we can experience no matter how much we're suffering, no matter how alone we feel, no matter how abandoned we may be. We can take all of those words to God, including our complaints about how we feel that God is not responding to us in our distress. God can handle all of our feelings, and we have permission to express those feelings of deepest distress and abandonment to God, God's self. Another thing that this psalm teaches us is that it's possible to experience abandonment by God and to trust in God at the same time. A lack of faith can coexist with faith in God. Think about the story in Mark's gospel where the young boy was stricken by an evil spirit that would throw him on the ground or throw him into the fire. The um, boy's father brought him to the disciples and asked them to cast the evil spirit out, but they couldn't do it. So they brought him to Jesus and asked if Jesus would help. And Jesus said, for those who believe, nothing is impossible. And I love what the father said. He said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Belief and unbelief can coexist together. It's possible to feel abandoned by God and to experience doubting in the midst of that feeling of abandonment and to also have faith at the same time. It's possible to experience both. And I imagine that Jesus was probably experiencing both at the same time. We can trust and doubt at the same time, and it's okay with God. 
when we feel helpless, we can still trust like we hear from the prophet Habakkuk and like the psalmist does. Remember, his words are not just words of complaint, but also words of praise as the psalmist remembers what God has done for the people in ages past. And the prophet Habakkuk does something similar. He is going through a horrible time. He has no understanding whatsoever of why God is doing what God is doing. But this is what he says. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. So Habakkuk says, I see no sense in what's going on all around me. I see suffering. I see enemies prospering. It looks, God, like you've kind of let things go. But even though things look so bad, I am placing my hope in you. I am trusting in you for my future. And that's what the psalmist is doing here, too, trusting in God for his future. We can still trust in God in our times of suffering by recalling, as the psalmist did, how God has helped us in the past. This is what gives us hope during those times that we may feel abandoned by God. We feel hope that even in abandonment, God will still act. The key to surviving a desperate situation is to acknowledge feeling forsaken by God and by remembering God's help in the past. As we're going to sing in just a minute, O oh God, our help in ages past, and what? Our hope for years to come. So we find hope by remembering what God has done in the past. That's what someone who is in our Bible study class is doing right now. My friend Karen has been working for the last 11 days to clean up the destruction that was left at a home of hers by Hurricane Helene. Um, she's been down in Columbia these last days and has been dealing with a lot, a lot of destruction. But this is what she wrote. She sent this to our Bible study class. This will be a long text, ladies, but I hope it can serve as a substitute for the time we would be together tonight. I have found no sorries, but only gratitude in our recent event. Yes, there's close to $30,000 damage on our property. And man, we are all so tired and emotional and hot. There's extensive damage to the three houses beside us, so everyone is crowding into our place. But let me fill you in on the blessings. We are located in the Cobb Cove. Our house, which my sister Kathy and I bought together in 1996, originally belonged to my sister's husband's parents. The other houses belonged to her husband, Wade's mama and uncle and aunt. This family was to my sister and me in our early 20s, the family we had not experienced and before we had our own families. Neither of us had a father figure at the time, so Big Wade became the person that, when on our first 4th of July at the lake, bought us each a fishing pole and took us fishing and has treated us as family ever since. So as you can tell, we are very close to the Cobbs especially Kathy, since she is now married to Wade and everyone else became her in-laws. When we went to the lake following Helene, I took minimal belongings since we knew we would be crowded. I took my Bible, but not our book study, so I'm really behind today, which was my prayer to catch up today because I love this study and you ladies, so I wanted to walk in prepared for good conversation. Let me share what I did for 11 days instead of Bible study. 
My sister and I had two hammocks set up in the yard. It was extremely hot, especially with the huge fire to burn all the brush we could. So we often took breaks in those hammocks. While there, my whole purpose was to praise God for all the wonderful blessings in my life, present and past, due to the cobs. I told Jesus all the stories I could think of over the years that he has given me just by letting our paths cross, and I thanked him for each and every memory. I'm going to tell you, ladies, that Jesus loves a good shady hammock. He sat right there with me, paying attention to every word I spoke to him, and I hope I was able to entertain and give him some rest as well. I have valued more than I can express those breaks we took over the last 11 days. To get a perspective, we, my sister and my family, are the youngest ones in the cove. Everyone else is in their 70s and 80s, so the hard work was ours to do. But the cobs fed us and laughed with us and gathered with us. Our children all came out on their days off and helped and gathered as well. So you see, ladies, there are great blessings even in the trials. If you don't have a hammock to share with Jesus, there's great peace in having a consistent meeting place with him. So in the midst of trials, she is praising God for all the blessings that she's experiencing. This is what the psalmist is doing in Psalm 22 in the midst of suffering, praising God for all that God has done. And knowing then that God is the hope for the time to come. So it's okay. Oh, by the way, I had Karen's permission to share that with you. She did tell me I could share that. It's okay if we feel abandoned by God and angry at God, while at the same time remembering God's help in ages past and hoping for God's help in the present. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of reflection is found on page 117. You may remain seated while we sing.
Will the ushers please come forward? Almighty God, we thank you for all of the blessings that you've given us, and we bring back to you these tithes and your offerings, asking that you would receive them and bless them, multiply them, and use them wherever they'll do the most good for you on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our closing hymn is for anybody who is feeling like the psalmist today, feeling um, cut off from God and maybe despairing, is a reminder to us that God does reach out and take our hands in times of trouble. Number 474.
And now may we all go in the peace and in the power of the Holy Spirit with great rejoicing out into the world to love everybody we meet as though we were meeting Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.